We live much of our lives by the clock and the calendar. The message is even stronger when the new year is the last of the millennium, carrying the number 2000. But what exactly is time? There are three answers, one in physics and philosophy. Time is a physical phenomenon. Another in psychology, our sense of passing time. The third in mathematics and engineering, the time that we measure and use to regulate our lives. Evelyn's angle will, of course, concentrate on the last of these three notions. How did we come to measure time in the first place? What exactly is it that our time pieces measure? This is where mathematics comes in. And what scientific principles do we use to construct ever more accurate clocks, both more mathematical? The measurement of time began with the invention of sandals in ancient Egypt, sometime prior to 1500 BC. However, the time the Egyptians measured was not the same as time today's clocks measure. For the Egyptians, and indeed for a further three millennia, the basic unit of time was the period of daylight. The Egyptians broke the period from sunrise to sunset into 12 equal parts, giving us the forerunner of today's hours. As a result, the Egyptian hour was not a constant length of time, as is the case today. Rather, as one twelfth of the daylight period, it varied with the length of the day and hence with the seasons. It also varied from place to place on the surface of the earth. And of course, time as a measurable concept effectively ceased during the hours of darkness. The need for a way to measure time independent of the sun eventually gave rise to various devices, most notably sand glasses, water clocks and candles. The first two of these utilized the flow of some substance to measure time. The later, the steady fall in the height of the candle. All three provided a metaphor for time as something that flows continuously and thus began to shape the way we think of time. Though the accuracy was never great, these devices not only provided a way to measure time, without the need for the sun to be visible in the sky. They also provided the basis for a concept of time that did not depend upon the length of the day, but it was to be many centuries before advantage was taken of that possibility. Instead of these time measuring devices carried elaborate systems from, of markings designed to give the time based on the sun dial, fragments of one 18th century water clock on how to set the clock for every single day of the year. Because the hours of darkness are the antithesis of the daylight hours, the scale for the nighttime hours was simply the daytime scale for the day exactly half a year earlier. For example, the scale for nighttime on July 1 was the daytime scale for January 1. In addition to their lack of accuracy, sand glasses, water clocks, and candles were also limited in the total length of time they could measure before having to be reset. As a result, they were largely used for measuring the duration of some activity, such as speech made by an orator, cooking time, or the length of a legal consultation. For most of history, ordinary people did not have regular and easy access to any kind of time measuring device whatsoever, other than to glance at the sky on a sunny day and see where the sun was. For them, time as we understand it today did not really exist. The one group in medieval times whose day was ruled by time, in a way not unlike people today, were the Benedictine monks with the ecclesiastically regulated prayer times, the eight conical hours just before daybreak, prime just after daybreak, third hour, sixth hour, ninth hour, eleventh hour, after sunset during the night, the signal that announced each conical hour and regulated the monk's day was ringing bell. This gives us our word clock, which comes from the medieval Latin word for bell clocker. Regardless of whether they were regulated by a sandal, a water clock, a candle, or the stars, the bells that were used to signal each new conical hour were rang according to a schedule based ultimately on the period of sunlight at that location and at that time of the year. Because they were not spaced equally apart, the conical hours provided a concept of time that in addition to changing throughout the year and from location to location, did not flow evenly as modern time does. Today we live much of our lives by the clock. We are awakened by an alarm clock. We listen to the radio at a particular time. We travel to and from work at a certain time of the day. We attend meetings that start and finish at predetermined times. We eat our meals according to the clock, not simply when we feel hungry. And the clock tells us when to go to a movie, to a concert, to a theater, or to watch our favorite television program. Indeed, not only are most of our daily activities regulated by the clock, 
they often rule down to precise minutes. This way of living is very recent. Not only does it depend on the uniform system of worldwide time measurement, it also requires that each one of us carries on our person a reliable means to keep track of time. The pocket watch and then the wristwatch also change the way we view and live our lives. Completion of the revolution in human life brought about the evolution for a concept of time was a much a technological step as an intellectual one. To live according to the regular bit of man-made time, we have to carry around with us more accurately since our present day watches do not yet communicate with each other or with any centralized time station. We carry around with us a device that manufactures a personal time that is built to be in synchronization with the official time to within a few seconds. The accuracy and cheapness of today's watches and clocks comes from an, an observation made by a Frenchman Curie in 1880. Curie noticed that when pressure is applied to certain crystals, quartz crystals for example, they vibrate at a certain highly constant frequency. Subsequent investigations showed that subjecting crystals to an alternating electric current also caused them to vibrate. The first use of this phenomenon was in the design of radios to provide a broadcast wave of constant frequency. Then in 1928, Marison of Bell Laboratories built the first quartz crystal clock, replacing the pendulum and various other mechanical oscillating devices of previous timepieces by the constant vibrations of the quartz crystal. The quartz clock was so accurate and reliable that already by 1939 it had replaced the mechanically regulated clocks at the observatory in Greenwich.